Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Rambus with Stephen Wu, who's going to talk today about how to make better use of memory for AI applications. Steve, there's been a lot of talk about memory bend within AI applications, but memory really isn't keeping up with what's going on in terms of the data, in terms of the throughput. What are people doing to address that? Well, it turns out there's a variety of techniques people are employing today to kind of compensate for the fact that they can't quite get as much memory bandwidth as they'd really like to get in order to allow the AI applications to perform their very best. Is it a function of just there's that much more data that has to be processed and moved around? Is it a function of uh, the memories themselves can't handle it and, and moving data back and forth between the two of them? What's the problem here? Well, there's really a variety of problems. They're all kind of come together in one place. And the amount of digital data we're generating in the world is growing dramatically, really far faster than almost any other technology can kind of keep up. And so uh, it's very difficult to keep all that data on chip. And external memory is the thing that people are using. But people would like to get even more bandwidth, and there's only so fast that that technology can progress. And so people have developed some interesting techniques to try and compensate for this difference between what the processing engines want and what the memory industry is able to provide. Why don't we drill down into this a bit? That sounds great. So Steve, what are we looking at here? Well, today I'm going to talk a little bit about the importance of number formats and being able to use different kinds of formats to extend the capabilities of the memory bandwidth that's available to you. So what we have here is um, some examples of some different popular formats that are used in AI applications. Uh, it turns out that um, IEEE, many years ago, defined a very popular type of format called 32-bit floating point numbers. And you see that on the top here. The 32 bits are split up into three components. A sign bit is one of those. Um, eight bits for exponent, which kind of describe a range that the numbers cover and a 23-bit mantissa, which is the fractional part of the number. Now, one thing you can do when you have a fixed amount of memory bandwidth is, instead of using large numbers that are 32 bits long, you can actually go to smaller size numbers, 16-bit numbers, and that has the effect of allowing you to pack twice as many numbers into the available bandwidth. And that's an interesting technique that people began to use. Now the difference here that you can see with 16-bit floating point numbers is you still have a single sign bit, but you now reduce the number of bits in the exponent and the mantissa, the fractional part of the number. And what that means is um, we're less precise with our numbers and we can cover a smaller range compared to 32-bit floating point numbers. And what people began to realize, especially in AI, was that the range that you needed to cover was very important, and it was a little bit less important to have exactly the type of precision that was available in 32-bit floating point numbers. And so a new type of numeric format called bfloat16 was developed. What bfloat16 does is it rebalances those 16 bits. You have one sign bit, but to match the range of 32-bit floating point numbers, we went back to 8-bit exponents. And then the fractional part of the number, the mantissa, is now down to seven bits. Can those be changed? Can you get seven bits for the exponent and eight bits for the mantissa, for example? You can, and that affects the accuracy and the time required to train your network. And so what people have found is that bfloat16 is a very nice compromise between trying to get you the range that you really need for many types of applications, while uh, not compromising the fractional precision too much in order to make the uh, networks not converge. And this is consistent with what AI has been bringing to the table anyway, which is everything gets more granular from your processors to your memory to your network bandwidth, right? That's right. So uh, what people have found is that uh, neural networks in particular are extremely tolerant of uh, changes in small changes in precision. And so this rebalancing of the bits has actually uh, been helpful in terms of allowing the memory bandwidth to be used more effectively while not compromising on the performance of neural networks. Is there a difference in terms of when you would do this? So for example, in an a automotive application where you're trying to say, okay, is it, am I going to hit this object? How fast am I moving versus um, doing something in a consumer electronics application where you don't really care? Does that matter? Yeah, there's actually a couple of different answers to that question. So uh, depending on the size of your neural network, when you have very large networks, and this is really across all different markets, if your network is very, very large, you tend to like to have better precision and better range. 
uh, but also when you're training, you like to have very high precision. You might actually train using a much higher precision set of numbers. And then when you go to inference, you might actually um, uh, reduce down to smaller size numbers so that you don't need to burn as much power and you don't need to spend as much memory bandwidth to get the kind of performance that you're training for. And part of this is also based upon the number of sensors that you have out in your network, right? So you think about the way the human brain works, it's not 100% accurate, but there are lots of different inputs. That's right. So um, different types of inputs could use different uh, dynamic ranges and different types of numbers. And then even the training process itself and the inference process itself can use different precision numbers at different parts of the computation. So for example, you might do accumulations at a much higher resolution, maybe 32 bits, while you might do the, the multiplies at something smaller like 16 bits. So taking all this into account, how much does this really improve performance and how much of an impact is there on accuracy? Well, that's a really good question, Ed. A couple of years ago at Hot Chips, Microsoft showed some very interesting data. And so what they showed was they showed that um, the performance of some of their neural network engines could improve dramatically when they reduced the precision of the numbers they were working with. And so in this particular case, they show going from 16 bits down to 8 bits. And you can see that um, both implementations on the Stratix 5 and the Stratix 10, uh, there were improvements in performance. In the case of the Stratix 5, there was about a little over a 3x improvement in performance. And in the case of the Stratix 10, they got the improvement above 7x. And so then the question becomes, OK, well, since I'm able to use my memory bandwidth better now and pack more numbers into it, maybe I'm losing something in terms of accuracy. And this was the results of their research. What they showed was that in blue here, when they trained with uh, full 32-bit floating point numbers, they got a reference level of accuracy of 1.0. When they dropped all the way down to, to their FP9 format, nine bits of, uh, uh, in the numbers, um, their accuracy dropped just a little bit, and you can see that the orange bars here are just a little bit lower than the blue. But what they showed was that through retraining and changes to the algorithm, they could then gain that accuracy back, and in some cases get even better accuracy than their reference 32-bit implementations. So now what they're really doing is engineering the AI itself as opposed to trying to fit it all into the technology. That's absolutely right. I mean, because memory bandwidth is so important and so precious, people are willing to change their algorithms to make the best use of what's widely viewed as the scarcest resource for these types of applications. So what are we looking at here? Well, let's say I go to the extreme and I allow for only one bit of fractional precision in my numbers. What that means is I can only encode numbers that either end in 0 0.0 or 0.5. So I can encode numbers like 0, 0 0.5, 1.0, 1.5, you know, uh, like that. And so what uh, some researchers discovered was that instead of having a fixed rule for rounding numbers either up or down, they decided to take a probabilistic approach to try and compensate for the fact uh, that we have reduced precision. So for example, in this scheme with one bit of fractional precision, again, I can only represent fractions that end in 0 0.0 or 0.5, but what if the number I care about is 0.2? What do I do? And so they developed an interesting idea called stochastic rounding, where you probabilistically round up or down depending on what values you can represent and what the value of your number is. And so this example shows here the probability that I'm going to round my number down to zero is uh, dependent on whatever the highest value is in that fraction that I can represent, the value I'm trying to encode, and then the range between the highest and lowest values that I can encode with my fractional precision. The probability that I round that number up is just 1 minus the probability I'm rounding down. So let me throw some numbers at this to show you how it works. So in this particular case with 1-bit fractional precision, uh, my high value is 0.5 and my low value is 0 0.0. And so the value I really want to encode is 0.2. And so the probability that I'm rounding my number down is just the high minus the value, which is 0.5 minus 0.2, divided by that range, 0.5 minus 0. So it's, there's a 60% chance that I'm going to round my number down. Um, and in the case of rounding up, it's just 1 minus that fraction, which is 40%. So 40% of the time, I would take my 0.2, I round it all the way up to 0.5. 60% of the time, I'd take my 0.2, and I'd round it all the way down to 0. 
So my expected value in the long run here is just 60% times zero, the number that I'm rounding down to, plus 40% times 0.5, the number that I'm rounding up to. And the long-term average, my expected value here is at 0.2, which is exactly what we wanted to encode. How often doesn't this work? Well, one of the challenges with doing something like this is that if you don't have enough trials or enough opportunities to round your numbers, you don't get the benefits of these long-term averages. You could deviate. And so that's one challenge, and you have to make sure you're uh, able to achieve kind of the long-term averages for whatever calculations you're doing. So the more data, the more accurate this becomes. That's right. The more opportunity you have to employ something like this, in general, the better it's going to work. Where would you employ this? What types of markets? Well, uh, for systems that really require the best power efficiency, so for example, uh, inferencing on endpoints that are perhaps battery operated in IoT type applications, you really need to balance the performance against using the minimal amount of memory storage and bandwidth. And so being able to use very small numbers with very few bits of fractional precision, this type of thing can really help you. So there's only so much you can get these days out of uh, shrinking, uh, out of new architectures. This is one more technique, and it's architecting the data as opposed to architecting the, the device itself, right? That's right. This is really one element of a whole area that people talk about called co-design, where the entire system has to be thought of not only from the hardware side, but the software side, and how you actually use your data, how you use your solution. A whole host of techniques are actually being employed now to kind of compensate for the fact that you can't get as much memory bandwidth as you want, and, uh, and the techniques that are in use today aren't necessarily as power efficient as people would like. And so techniques like stochastic rounding help you to get around these types of things. And our industry just needs to continue working hard and coming up with new methods to continue advancing AI. How commonplace is this these days in terms of uh, using it in AI systems? Is it actually being employed or is it just being looked at? Um, so uh, that's a good question. People aren't always as straightforward with exactly what they're deploying. But what we've seen from the research is that this is an area that people have looked at very heavily. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if it was being uh, used in a number of applications. Stephen Wu, thanks for a great explanation.